Welcome to the Middle Earth Philosopher, where you take a look at ideas, people, and relationships within Middle Earth and try to examine them from a philosophical point of view that people in that world may have held. I'm going to start a four-part series on the Gondorian Civil War, known to book fans as the Ken Strife. However, I'm not going to look at it from the point of view of events as it were, but rather from its three main leaders, that being King Valakar, um, a temporary king, Castamir, who everyone knows as the founder of the Corsairs of Umbar, and Valakar's son, Eldakar. So this being the first video, we're gonna start with Valakar. Now, the first thing to note about Valakar is that he is the son of King Minokar of Gondor who was also known as Romendasil II, which is also translates to East Victor because of a war that he wages on the Easterlings in the year 1248 of the Third Age. This war being because they were Gondor was having um, skirmishes with the Easterlings quite often and that Minicar had been concerned about them as well. So he decides to try and put an end to it, or at the very least, um, put a dent in their operations, as it were, by destroying their base camps in um, the east of Middle Earth. That being said, um, there was also another reason for this, being that um, Gondor had allies in the east as well, in the area uh, called Ravanian, which was made up also of different tribes. But these tribes were at least supposed to be allied to Gondor. And they were also related to them by blood because they were considered middlemen because of their connections through the Edain of the First Age. So even after this victory, Minokar is still concerned about the affairs in the East because he thinks or believes that there may be reason that some of the Rovinian tribes may not have been that loyal or maybe on the verge of joining the Easterlings to start raiding Gondor on their own. The war was in part to help discourage this if that was the case, but he also wants to keep them as strong allies, at the very least as auxiliaries or as a so-called buffer state, if you will. So he sends his son, Valakar, up to Ravanian, um, to one of the largest provinces there, under a king, and I may be slaughtering this, but bear with me on this, Prince Virugavia, who considers himself the king of all Ravanian. Debate whether yourself, whether you think that's arrogant or not, but there you are. Valakar spends some number of years up in that tribe and participates in their army, which presumably means he was fighting in whatever skirmishes and battles that they were having, and also to get to know the culture more and come to an understanding of the culture as well. Now, it's said that Valakar exceeds the king's expectations by not only being an ambassador to Ravanian, but essentially pulling a Dances with Wolves slash Last Samurai and falling in love with the culture, even to the point where he marries one of the princesses. Her name being recorded as Virumavi. Because of this marriage, he ends up having a son called Eldakar, who is primarily raised in Rovanian, unlike his father who spent the majority of his years raised in Gondor before moving to Rovanian. And initially this causes some waves back in Gondor because of the fact that he is the heir to the king and he's marrying outside of his race, basically. So the Gondorians were particularly well known for basically keeping it within their people. Um, they don't like uh, bringing in other blood into their lines. So we're not talking like, again, Klu Klux, Klu Klux Klan level racism here, but there is a, I feel anyway, a low key prejudice there. That being said, I think that because this was happening in Rovani and not initially in the courts of Gondor, um, it wasn't particularly a major problem yet, as it were, even though, as I said earlier, he is the heir to the king. Now, while this does plant the seeds for the future civil war to come on a large scale level, on a smaller scale level, 
right now it's not that big a deal. There's the potential for problems, but right now it's not a major problem. No one's quite ready to shed blood over this quite yet. Now, by 1260, he does have to go back to Gondor to take up the mantle of king. And this is initially now where it now becomes an issue. I'm not sure if it was a thing that the Gondorian nobles and people thought that, you know, his marrying Vidomavi was a fling or that he just kind of needed to take care of some urges, as it were, and just kind of marry there for that time and then expected him to divorce her or whatever before he came back. But whatever their thoughts and expectations might have been, he undermined them by bringing his entire family, along with some of the nobles from Novanian, back to the court with him. Now, it's said that the whole reason that his father even agreed to this marriage was a political one. That being that Vidogavia was considered, again, a powerful warlord in Rovanian, and he wanted to keep that allyship there. So um, he more or less was kind of forced to um, allow the marriage to go through. So yet, despite that, none of that made it any easier for the people who were hating on Valakar and his wife and his family for the decision that he made. But again, it is not yet at the point of civil war. It just laid the seeds for it, because now there is discontent in portions of Gondor that their king is marrying an alien foreigner, basically. So now that we have the background out of the way, what is the worldview and philosophy behind all this? What was it that allowed Valakar to exceed his own culture and put himself in this position? Well, to start with, we have to understand, I think, the worldview of Gondorians overall at this time, which was that, as I said earlier, there was a low-key prejudice there, but it was because they considered themselves a better people because they were descended from Numenor. They still had the long lives, as it were, that made them different from the rest of the human race in Middle-earth. And that was something they wanted to keep because Gondor was very, I guess you can say, conservative and traditional in that way. It was very insular, even though they were still empire building as well. So go ahead and work that out if you can. Now, this prejudice wasn't just due to Numenorean blood, because Arnor, which was the kingdom to the north and was, they were both once part of a larger kingdom at one time in the past, um, they thought themselves better than Arnor as well. And when uh, there is a debate where one of the kings had married a, Rova excuse me, a Arnor princess, and that they had run out of kings basically in Gondor because they had been killed by the Easterlings. Um, Arnor starts calling in favors and says, hey, you don't have a king, we're in trouble, we need to work together. And by blood and by right, um, we should now, we now have an heir for the king, for the throne for both kingdoms. And Gondor basically said, no, that's okay. We have our own kings, thank you very much. So. Gondor also felt that their culture in overall was just better on top of all that. Now, all that being said, they still didn't mind working with other peoples, like occasionally the elves and with, as I said earlier, the Ravanian tribes. So there was no issue collaborating with them. It was just an issue of intermarriage because at that point, impure bloodlines and, you know, say bye-bye to long life as it were. Now, this is important to note because this is the world that Valakar was initially raised in. So when he first goes to Ravanian, that is the world view. Those are the glasses that he that he's taking with him when he goes up to represent the throne of Gondor and the Gondorian people. So it is important that in some way, shape or form, the culture of Ravanian impressed itself on him so much that Valakar was willing to let go or at least let go in part of that native worldview of his own culture and start adopting some of the ways or maybe even all of the ways of the culture of Rovanian. 
It may have been one where he was impressed by the more direct nature, um, given that um, Rovanians don't put up with a lot of bullshit, which is my impression of it. Um, maybe it was just by the fact that the annals do say that they're very courageous in war and they're very aggressive. So maybe, maybe he was impressed by the fearlessness of that people. Um, it is said that um, a lot of the tribes in Rovanian are a precursor to Rohan since Rohan is one of the descendants from those peoples. So, you know, it may have been that factor as well. But whatever the case, it basically changed Valakar and basically influencing him to start changing his worldview, changing his um, lifestyle, and again, to the point where he marries outside of that and starts having children outside of that as well, which is breaking the cultural taboo. So in that sense, you can say Valakar was very progressive and he knew how to, it sounds like how to walk both lines because it seems like the reason why war had not broken out even after he returns to Gondor with Ravanian people is that he knew enough about Gondor of, I think anyway, of what to say, what to do, and what to not say, and what to not do in the Gondorian courts while he's there. But, you know, in private or anywhere else, maybe he's behaving more like a Rovanian at that point. Um, it doesn't say exactly, but um, that's my hypothesis on that anyway. That being said, though, um, I do think that there may have been some naivety on Valakar's part as well, in the sense that he knows he's the heir to the throne of Gondor. He knows the traditional views that his people have about marrying outside of their race. He is aware of all of this. He can't be and still be an heir to the king, for God's sake. So it seems kind of not dumb or stupid, but just, again, naive that he would think that, you know, shit was not going to go down if he marries this woman that, you know, beautiful as she may have been or whatever. Um, she's not from Numenor. She is not, she has no Numenorian blood in her whatsoever. So, um, who's to say what his thinking was on that? Maybe he was just that much in love, I guess. I don't know. It may have been a case where he was not expecting war to break out over his decision. Since, um, as far as I know anyway, it wasn't like the taboo of not marrying outside of Numenorian race was a law, okay? There was no law, as far as I can find, that said no Gondorians cannot do this or Gondorian nobles and kings cannot do this because it was the kings and nobles who were, who were bigger on that than most. But, regardless, that's the decision that he makes and it sets up this collision of cultures, as it were between that of Rovanian and that of Gondor and their different worldview on things. That being said, um, it wasn't a bad thing that Valakar was as progressive as he was, as it notes that um, through his son um, and perhaps through any other intermarriages that happened through Rovanian, Rovanian nobles as well after the Civil War, that Gondor's armies become more fiercer and more aggressive in war. So it wasn't like this was a bad worldview, but again, at that time, uh, the culture of Gondor was just very conservative and very big on tradition. And uh, I guess you can say that with any great change comes great conflict as well.